Hey guys, welcome back to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. If you haven't clicked that like button, make sure you do. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you do. It helps the channel a lot. And in the end of the day, it really helps, it helps all of us come together and understand life better. Okay, none, none of that's true. But if you do hit the like and subscribe, that helps us a bunch, as well as checking out the links in the description. Why are you even here? Well, today we're doing another sermon review, and I just wanted to set the mood for us as we get into this sermon review. If you're new, sermon reviews, we do them each week. We look at three specific things in a variety of different sermons that we look at, but always asking the same three questions. One, do they read the scriptures? Two, do they use context and culture to bring out the truth and application of those scriptures? And three, do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to be looking at today when we look at a sermon by someone named Nick Hand from Celebration Church. Also, this is a sermon that one of you guys sent in. If you are interested in doing the same thing, you can do so in the comment section below or send it in via DM on Instagram or email as well. There's lots of ways for you to get sermons to us. The list is very long though, so just keep that in mind. Now, so today, let's go ahead and just hop into the review screen. We're going to be looking at, again, like I said, Nick Hand. If you want to watch this entire sermon without my review, the whole thing is 48 minutes long. If you want to watch it without all of my commentary, all of this golden information that you're about to receive, <laughs> the link will be in the description below and you can watch it all by your lonesome without my commentary. Won't that be lonely? It probably would be. Okay, so let's go ahead and get right into it, guys. I don't want to, I don't want to use a lot of time, so let's go. If you have your Bibles, uh, let's open to the book of Mark. We're going to look in Mark chapter 8 this morning. Mark chapter 8. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture uh, starting in verse 22. You may be familiar with it, you may not. Uh, but whether you are or not, uh, that's okay. We're going to just talk about some things that I really think that can be helpful to us today. Verse 22, it says this. It says, they came to Bethsaida and some people, everybody say some people, some people. Some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Verse 23 says, he, being Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When, no, this kind of gets funny. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? The text continues saying, he looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Verse 25, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Verse 26 says, Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. You know, stories like this for me are kind of interesting to think about because so he starts off, right? So what we're always looking at in a sermon uh, is how, how it's built. So he starts off really well, right? Going right into the text. And the assumption would be here in a minute that uh, hopefully, you know, that he would uh, give us some sort of background or exegetical, like working through of where this falls within the text. Um, also, though, one of the things that I didn't stop it because I just, I just started it. But anytime someone starts reading a text, you want to pull it up. Right? You want to make sure if it's on your phone or on your physical Bible, you actually open your Bible to that spot because that is going to help you for a couple of different reasons. One, if Mark here doesn't go then into the actual context, at least you have your Bible open and you have a very quick overview, at least of the context in front of you if you needed it. So Nick has just read this. Let's see how he kind of follows this up then. Because if you grow up in church or you've been surrounded by uh, parables, things that are, you know, are written in scripture, like you hear stories like that and you're like, oh, wow, like that's really cool that Jesus healed this man. But if you actually stop and think about what happened, it's a pretty crazy story. You have this man who has been blind. We know from the text that he has at some point in his life, because it says his sight was restored, that at some point in his life he had lost his sight. This is a man who used to be able to see, and this is what really gets tough for us as humans. When you experience a good life, and then life happens, and life isn't as good as it used to be, I think that's one of the most discouraging things to have to overcome as a person, as a human. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, 
to taste what a good life is, to taste what a fulfilled life is, to taste what it feels like to maybe get to a certain place, like I've always wanted to be here, and then to lose it and be like, what do I do now? Where do I go from here? When you think about this story and you think about the fact that this was actually something that happened, Jesus takes this man and leads him out of the village. He spits on his eyes. He asks the man, hey, can you see anything now that I put my spit in your eyes? I mean, think about, th think about just the context as a person, as a human. The man responds, I see men walking around like trees. And as he continues, Jesus touches his eyes again. And this time he's healed. This last week, I was, uh, actually a couple weeks ago now, I, uh, I decided in moving this time, most of the times when I moved, because I moved a lot, like around. Now, this is a good example, so I want you to pay attention. Oftentimes, I tell, you know, I, I talk about how stories should be something that if we're going to tell them in a sermon, they should add to the sermon, right? So if there's something maybe innocuous or hard to understand within the sermon that maybe could be cleared up with a story that then, you know, puts it in sort of a modern day context or makes it a little bit more understandable. Stories can be very helpful. Stories can also be time fillers or fluff. So the question we need to ask is, so the stories he's about to tell about moving, does that have anything to do with what we've read in Mark? Does it, does it help us understand Mark better? Does it help us understand the story of the blind man? Like what, like, what purpose does this serve, right? And if it does serve a purpose, great, did it do it well? Or if it doesn't, why was it in there? So we're always looking for that, like asking that question. But you know what I wish in life? The reason I tell the story is I was thinking about this. I wish that there was like, when we showed up as humans, there was like this manual that like just told us all the things that we need to do to kind of make sense of all the things that we will ever go through in our life. And I understand we have this guide of scripture, but if we're all honest, I think we all kind of have these questions in our mind like, what does this all mean? Did anybody crack the code of life this week? Like, is there anybody in here that figured out, like, what the... So, a couple things. One, like, this piano playing in the background the whole time he talks is driving me insane. I can't take it. But we're going to have to clearly deal with it, so this is where we're at overall meaning is and context can contextualize it and put it into words for me like does anybody know what the what the destiny does any let me ask you this question where are you heading where are you, where are you on your way to do you know the answer to that question most of us would probably struggle to try to put it into words where are you heading um to my future well wh where is your future well, how, how are you going to get there i'm going to follow my my dreams well what, well what are your dreams you know that's a good question I, I, I kind of like this and I kind of like that. And we, we struggle with these things of, of where am I really going? And then if I, I mean, we could get really simple with it. Did, does anybody actually even know where you're at in life? Like, <laughs> okay, I'll stop, I promise. Like, I'm not trying to make you have an existential crisis here, but if you think about these things, like these are the things that I think, that I think about a lot because all of us as humans, we're on this planet and we're no doubt searching. That's one thing that if you kind of just took a step back and observed the, 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 the landscape of life and humanity and existence, all of humanity is searching. This is why you're here this morning. You're searching for something. You're okay, so that's a pretty good indicator um, for a couple of things. One, like what is the purpose for church, right? So we ask this question a lot when we're doing these sermon reviews because it comes up a ton. Like is, is the gathering on, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday evening, right? What's the purpose of that? Is it to uh, have a place for people that are searching and asking questions? Is it a place for the, the, those that already follow Jesus to gather and worship him and fellowship together? Is it a mix of both? Like, what is the sermon supposed to be? Like, all of these questions actually give you a pretty good indicator. If you, if you look at the church that you attend or the church that you view a lot, kind of what's their ministry methodology, right? And does it line up with scripture? That's the key. Um, in scripture, what we see are fellow believers gathering together to fellowship together, to learn the learn Jesus' teachings together, to, to fellowship and eat together. Uh, there, there's a lot we could get into, but that involves communion. Um, the, so there's a lot there. And all of the indicators we have from the gathering of believers within the scriptures are believers coming together to worship Jesus, all of it. Now, again, I don't think I have to tell you, we took a real quick exit away from Mark. We are a couple blocks down, uh, two left turns and a right from the text right now. Like, I, 
I, I guess Mark was just like an intro <laughs> to what he wanted to talk about. Let's see if we ever get back to it. You're looking for meaning. You're looking for purpose. You want your life to count for something. You want to know that when you breathe your last breath, <sighs> it mattered. So we search, but we don't exactly know where we're going. And I think because of that, we're, we're, we live in a, in, a, in a culture that craves signs. Can I, can I get a, has anybody just ever been desperate for a sign? Now, this is an indicator, by the way. I don't, again, I don't know what denomination this is. Fairly unimportant. But you can tell by the rhetoric that is used what, a little bit at least, of what denomination you're coming from. Now, he's talking about the, on the backboard are shifting for a better life, I think. I forget exactly what it says. The point is, I think this leans sort of charismatic Pentecostal a bit because you're talking about signs, you're talking about looking for signs, you're talking about shifting, uh, you know, atmospheres, that sort of thing, all sort of indicators of charismatic Pentecostalism. Um, again, not going to get into that here, but you need to know at least where the pastor is coming from, from at least, at least a, um, a slightly theological perspective so you understand how they're viewing scripture and how they're viewing the Christian life because denominations do give us a really good lens to understand how people are approaching the scriptures and the sort of what they're pulling from them sometimes good sometimes bad we search for signs and we crave signs and and, and the, the funny thing about scripture if you read the bible like God is big on signs God wants you to be sick he wants you to know that where you're at is perfectly okay and where you're at whether you're, whether it be something good that you're facing whether it be something bad that you're facing he's with you where you're at God is big on signs but if you're anything like me sometimes it's hard to see the signs sometimes it's sometimes it's difficult to, to, to be able to grasp and to contextualize and to really know like am I at where I'm supposed to be his whole point was that you get stuck or frustrated if you don't see signs Oftentimes, if you're stuck or frustrated because you don't see signs, it's because you're relying more on the signs than you're relying on on your 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 the fact that you are in Christ. You you follow Jesus. You keep your eyes on Jesus. You focus and pursue Him in all of these variety of aspects in life. So if it's hard, you focus on Jesus. If it's good, you keep your eyes on Jesus. If it's if it's a mild, mediocre, boring day and you're living a quiet life. You focus on Jesus. Like all of it is always about focusing on Jesus. And the question being like, am I in the right place? Am I in the right ministry? Am I pursuing the right things? Like all of these questions are things that you are relying on God for. We, we don't see within the scriptures, uh, especially in the New Testament, of any sort of like, like going after God's purpose and destiny in your life. Like all of these, all of that is foreign to the scriptures. You are supposed to live your life well spreading the message of Jesus wherever you're at. When you can't see the signs, you feel stuck. Yeah. The text says that this man isn't even searching for Jesus himself. He has people that have brought him to Jesus to be healed. The text says he takes him by the hand and leads him out of the village. Well, this is interesting to me. And I, and I want you to write this down because I think oftentimes in life, one of the reasons we can't see the signs that really give us the courage, the drive, the intensity, the desire to keep searching. Because I've found in life that life is more about the search than it is the finding. It's more about the quest to ask questions and God, are you here? Okay, so one of the things we're looking for here and what we're going to see him sort of do is take this, um, this, situation where Jesus takes this man out of the city and he's going to use it in a way that then eisegetes a bunch into the text. So though we don't have a lot of indicator clues, and I want to be careful that I don't do the same thing that I've already told you not to do, which is read things in the text. I think that contextual clues here indicate that Jesus seems to take this man out of the city so that he isn't surrounded by a bunch of people that only then follow him later because of his the ability to heal people. And this seems to be, again, I don't want to read too much into it, but it seems to be this idea that he's trying to keep, at least currently, his identity sort of on the down low. Doesn't want a lot of people to know. There's a lot of contextual clues that we're not even going to get into here. Looking, searching. It's easy in life when we go through things to stop the searching, to get stuck. I think one of the things that keeps us stuck, that keeps us missing the signs, is this idea of our surroundings. 
If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. One of the things that causes me to miss out on the signs that keep me searching are my surroundings. I mean, and what's interesting to me about this is these are like good people. These are people who fought for him, but there's going to come time in your life where you don't just need people who are going to tell you that you're going to make it and tell you that one day God will, one day God will, one day God will. Eventually, you're going to have to turn the page. You're going to have to have people in your life that say God's going to do it today. You're not just going to have to have people that encourage you to keep fighting, but sometimes the chapter is going to turn and people who were with you for a season, not everybody who goes with you can grow with you. Like there are there are good things that could be preached from from Mark chapter eight verse twenty two till the till uh what is it it's twenty two through uh, twenty six. There are good things I didn't write down that last verse. I'm going to do that. There are good things that could be preached from here. Just a really quick summary, like the fact that Jesus can heal, the fact that Jesus cares to heal, uh, the reality that this man um, is able to see, which is actually a fulfillment of prophecy, right? That he, will, the blind will see, uh, the deaf will hear, uh, the, what is it? The captives will go free. Like all of these things, um, Jesus is fulfilling in the very action of healing someone, declaring himself uh, via the action that he is the Messiah. He is the promised one. Like the, the redemption has come to the people of Israel, right? There's so much here that can be preached about his healing power, his ability to heal, his caring to even do so, that he is God. We're not looking at any of that though right now. We're, we are seriously focusing on, um, we are missing the signs because of our surroundings. And that is all, like I need you to understand, all of that is taken from the verse where Jesus leads the man out of the city. And the only reason he leads him out of the city, contextual clues, as I've already said, is so that there's not a huge crowd. That's the only reason. There's no really other logical reason for him to do so. But now Nick has taken this to be, you need to be taken out of your surroundings so you can actually see the signs. Where, where are you living in your head? Because sometimes you'll start thinking, God, where are you at? What are you doing? How come you're not moving? Could I get a sign? And the signs are right there before you, but it's a result of the place that you're dwelling. Sometimes God has to take you by, a hand, by the hand and say, it's time for you to step out of that village. It's time to step out of that place of, of thinking. It's time to step out of that city. And it may have benefited you for a season, but there are times, see, God gives people assignments. Your life is not just to exist and get a good job and have a career and climb the ladder and become something great in the eyes of men. You have assignments. There is no good life outside of a life of surrender. There, what, am, what am I talking about? There is no good life. There, there is, there's, there's no code. There's no script. There's no, you're going to do this and you're going to do this and then everything's going to, that's not the way that, that, th that things work. God is not a gumball machine that we put a quarter in and he pops out a gumball. That's not, what, that's not how, how he works. He wants to work in tandem with humanity that, God, I am following you wherever you go. And if you're going to put it in a fish's mouth and get it to me, then you're going to put it in a fish's mouth to get it to me. I'm not going to be worried about how it comes. I'm not going to be worried about how the miracle comes. I'm going to believe that you did not bring me this far to leave me. You didn't teach me to swim to let me drown. You didn't build your home in me to move away. And you did not lift me up to let me down. I'm talking about in life, there are going to be things that you see. And if you're not careful, you'll count it <laughs> what in what in your life have you counted as as maybe the devil or satan that could actually be saliva could actually be god doing something behind the scenes and trying to get something to you but you're missing because you're missing out on your miracle because it doesn't look the way that you think it should look now to be fair like I said, I'm gonna to try to break in less because I don't want this. I don't want this video to be too like super long, which it already is gonna be really long. But that last part wasn't bad in and of itself. In regards to if you take it out of this whole sermon and just you know just say, hey, what's some good advice? Good advice is you know a life of surrender toward God is a great life to live. It's like you said, it's one where if I'm go if you're going this way, I'm going this way. I don't know how you're working it out, but I know you're gonna work it out. Like that right there, not bad. Again, if you take it out of this sermon and you're just talking to somebody and, you know, guys are giving each other advice and whatever, like, that's not bad advice. Like, no, God's not going to work the same way every single time. And he is going, 
there are going to be some really weird situations or really t- tough or terrible situations that you go through that you don't think are good that actually he uses for his glory. So I, I do want to give him kudos where kudos is due, right? So it has nothing to do with the sermon or the text or anything like that. That advice was solid though, right? A life of surrender is a good life. So good on him for that part. This is what I talk about when I talk about surrender. When church doesn't look, I mean, what, what could God never underestimate the power of the local church? Like I, 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 my education, the things that I've learned, my skill set, everything that I have, everything that I am as a person has been developed through this place. Literally. Literally. I don't have some big impressive degree. I don't have, I don't have tons of accolades that make me seem important. Everything that is happened in my life that has been good has happened as a result of being a part of this community that is centered around a cause now how does that make sense that see now that's really interesting and i don't want to make an assumption here because if you go to their site like like it talks about jesus so i don't want but he just said it's centered around a cause all right well what's the cause right so if i'm visiting this church so far i haven't heard a whole lot about jesus being god i heard about jesus healing somebody right and I probably, if I, if I don't go to church a lot, I probably have heard about Jesus and the fact that he's a good teacher and that he heals people and that people pray to him maybe is what I've heard, right? But so what's the church for? Well, so the church is centered around a cause. What cause? Like, what's the cause? <laughs> is, it, is it the Great Commission, right? To, to go out and uh, tell others about Jesus. Like, again, the church website talks about, I think, knowing him and making him known. So the church website is pretty fairly clear. But again, a lot of people aren't going to go there. So when you're talking, and this is just a, just a advice for us as leaders or pastors as we're, as we're preaching sermons, we need to be as clear as possible in what we're saying. Because some people aren't ever going to follow up and aren't ever going to look, and all they're going to hear is what you say. So it's just an important reminder. What, what am I talking I, I always coined it like this. Surrender is letting go of my idea of how I think things should look. Letting go of my idea of how I think things should look. So when I come into the presence of God, when I lift my hands in worship, when I say, God, I need you, I'm not just articulating words, expressing myself to get God to do what I want, thinking that if I worship him enough, somehow he will meet my needs. Instead, what I'm actually communicating is, God, I'm letting go of my idea of how I think my life should look, and I'm going to trust you that however you want to get me there, you're going to get me there. You will be faithful. You would be faithful. You have been faithful. And I trust regardless of what I see. Regardless if it gets messy, I'm, I'm amused by the people that quit the church when ministers fall or people stab them. And the, the church is a messy place because we're a family. The Bible says that God takes the lonely and he puts them in families. That's what the church community is, is supposed to be. We have to have grace for each other. We have to have empathy for each other. When one another falls, we got to lift each other up. We don't kick them when they're down and say, well, I guess this is the funny one. This is the funny one. I guess they weren't the real deal. Are you? What does that even mean? So here's, we've gotten to the part of this particular sermon, and it happens in a lot of sermons that we watch, not all of them, but a lot, where the text really seems to be just like a jumping off point into like, it, albeit some, some solid advice, but the text is still just a jumping off point to that. Like, so if we were to eliminate Mark chapter 8, 22 through 26 entirely, and just put, you know, Nick on stage and say, hey, Nick, give us some advice. Um, this seems to be what he would probably give us. Because this isn't connected to Mark chapter 8 at all. This is just advice that Mark is giving on the, on the edges of what he's talking about in regards to Mark. So he's talking about surrender being good. He's talking about, um, you know, living a, a surrendered life and what that looks like and how, you know, the church family affects that and how the church family is good for you. And like, and like all of this isn't bad advice. All of this is actually, I mean, some of it is pretty solid stuff, but it's not connected to the actual text we're talking about. And I think what happens a uh, a lot, at least what I've seen in doing these sermon interviews as I do them, is that texts are usually presented because that's how sermons have always been given. That's how Sunday morning always goes. So you have the worship, and then you have the reading of the scripture, and then you have somebody get up and they they do you know the sermon. And because that's how we're used to things happening all the time, um, that people just do that still. But now they've sort of ignored the like 
they'll like, well, we'll read the scripture and we'll stick with it a little bit. And then we'll eventually get to what we would actually want to talk about, which is what I want to talk about, which is this, that, or the other thing. And this is kind of where we're at. Like we came into church, we opened the Bible, we opened to Mark, we read through Mark. We were sort of on Mark for a minute and now we're just not even close. The Bible says that the, this is what the anointing does. <laughs> the anointing destroys yokes and it removes burdens. This is, why we, this is why we need the family of the body of Christ. God has, this is when, when people say, you ever heard, I think I've even talked about it, where you have, you have an it factor. You have something that you can do that nobody else can do. You occupy a space on this earth that no, what I'm saying is, what I'm really saying is you have an anointing that no one else has. Why does that matter? You have an ability to destroy yokes and remove burdens in a way that nobody else does. Let's make that modern technology. What was a yoke? A yoke was a, a contraption that, put to, uh, to pieces or, or animals of livestock so that they could pull something. It's representative of, of toil. It's representative of, it's a representation of, of struggle. It's a representation of, of, um, uh, of, of works and in, in, in the hard things in life. What I'm saying is there's things that God has given you to do that when you do them, you're actually breaking the struggle off of people. You're breaking the, to you're breaking the striving off of people. And when you don't operate in your anointing, people miss out. When I, when I settle for, I can, I, I can come up here as a communicator and I've done it. Okay, this is why, like, let me just stress a again. <sighs> Everything I say as, uh, as I'm preaching should be connected back to the word of God in some form or fashion. Because if not, it is literally just me talking and it's not worth a whole lot, right? You can give some really good advice and sometimes that advice is very helpful and sometimes that advice works, but that advice, you know, may or may not work all the time for everybody. When we get to the scriptures as believers, we believe that they are authoritative and good for all people. As believers, we believe that God has given us his word via the scriptures for all things good for life and practice. And they have authority over us because it is Jesus' words. Uh, it, well, it's, it's, it's God, Jesus being God, God's words for us throughout time. That being said then, we need, as, a, as pastors, when we're preaching, what we're preaching needs to be connected to the word. Nothing that he's saying right now is he giving us any sort of ver verse or reference for, or even a passing reference for. Like, so even if he's not preaching on that passage, we're not, like, where, where is the, the connection to anything he said to scripture? This is why I would I always advocate that if you're gonna if you're gonna preach through it, it might as well be expositionally going through a, a section of verses so that when we're doing that we can not only connect it back to the culture and context it's written in but we are able to pull out the truth of that and the application of that and the principles found within that and demonstrate how this is in scripture and therefore as believers we should live or follow or do this thing or that thing why because it is the authoritative word of God. If it's not connected, it is literally a TED Talk. I know that is an ongoing joke, but it is literally a TED Talk. It is someone's good advice passed on to you. And a lot of people have some really good advice. Not all of it should have authority in your life. And when, as pastors, if we get up on a platform or a stage or behind a pulpit or however, and on a rock, right? I don't care in the middle of a field. If you're proclaiming something as a pastor, that thing should be able to be connected to scripture in some form or fashion. And if it is a passing reference, at least give that reference to people. Because when you walk off, when I'm done preaching, I do not want people to say, that was a really good thing Michael said. I want them to say, the scriptures say this, and that is why I do this thing. And my job as a, as a proclaimer of the word of God is to make that if it's not clear, to try to make it as clear as possible, and if it is clear, to show them the depths of the clarity within the culture and context that it was presented in, to show them that this isn't just good advice, this is God's advice. God, do you see me? Do you see what we're dealing with? Do you see what my family's going through? Do you see the tears that I cry? Do you see my broken heart? Do you, do you see me? Did God make a mistake? No. 
Sometimes I can't see the signs because of my surroundings. Sometimes I can't see the signs because of the systems. Sometimes I can't see the signs because of how I see what I see. Sometimes I can't see the signs, God's goodness, the miracles, what God is actually doing because of how I see what I see. You know, one of the things that I've learned about God is that God cares more about how I see than what I see. Why? Because God can change what I see in an instant. But I decide how I see. God can heal your body. God can give you money. God can give you a new job. But how do you see your money? How do you see your job? I can, I, I can look at my bank account. And I can see that my bank account may not have as much money as I want in it, but if I know where my provision comes from, how I see matters a whole lot more than what I see. Uncle, you can come back to the piano. So we asked this man, do you see anything? I see people, but they look like trees. What are you doing, God? I think sometimes God will see, let you see people that look like trees so that when you see people, you'll still see them through the trees. Let me say it again. What does that even mean? I think sometimes in life, the miracle worker will let you see people that look like trees so that when you actually see people, you'll see them through the trees. He who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So that, that right there, I just want to stop on. I know we're getting pretty late in the sermon review here. But he says he, he, he died on the tree so we could rise above our, our issues. Um, that, that, that's a bit concerning to me when I hear it, right? So he, had, he did just previously say that Jesus bore uh, our sins on the tree. Right. So that's that's good. He talks about Jesus taking our sin upon himself on the cross. But then his sort of explanation for why wasn't to reconcile us to God, wasn't to free us from sin. It was to rise above our our issues and our situations. Which is a very like. Is a result of being freed from sin and being reconciled to God is the ability to to maybe rise above or see our situations differently because uh, we see them clearly now. Like we're, we're not a slave to sin. So we not, you know, we don't, we see sin for what it is, but that's not the sole purpose of the cross was to help us rise above. Cause we're not technically the one rising above. We didn't have the ability, which is why Jesus had to die on in our place for our sins. So that, that's a bit problematic. So um, I just wanted to pull that out, right? So that's the only part of even close, the closest we've gotten to here of the gospel being proclaimed is Jesus burying our sins on the tree, which is great. But then the result of that, the implication of that seems to be simply so we can rise above things, not so we can be reconciled to God, not so that we could be freed from sin. Um, a bit problematic. Sometimes God will allow you to go through situations and things to work on how you see so that you never stop seeing through the trees. What in your life do you see that seems like a mistake, but if you see it through the tree, it looks a whole lot different? Again, I, I, he doesn't ever plainly say this, but basically what he's saying is what situation is going on in your life that when you see it through the cross, right? That's, that's how I'm taking it. Maybe that's not how he means it, but I think he's just trying to use some wordplay here and say, what situation are you going through that when you see it through the cross, uh, you see it differently, which is a great point. It really is. I mean, if we're, we're talking about the gospel here, this idea that there are situations and circumstances and things in your life that look terrible or look really good, but when you see them through the cross, because you have a shift in perspective because of the gospel and its effect on your life, then you do see them differently. So this, this is a great point here. 
when I know who I am and I know the anointing that I possess, I know the secret sauce that I have, not because I deserved it, but because for whatever reason, he thought that I should be here and he thought that I should have this because he wanted me to use it one day. I've bought into this lie some thing, sometimes that, you know, if it's meant to be, it'll be. I think I've missed out on a lot of things because of that mentality. He said, ask and keep on asking. He said, seek, search, and keep on searching. He said, knock. And then if the door doesn't open, turn around and head back home. That's not what he said. Knock and keep on knocking. Knock and keep on knocking. It's actually Matthew 7, 7. You can go look it up, but it's not knock and keep on knocking. Knock and keep on knocking. Because what God has placed in you is greater than anything that could ever come against you. I know this from experience. Before I step onto this platform today, I went to the bathroom back there and I said, God, I, I don't feel qualified. I don't see what I do is certainly important. I don't think it's that dignified or super special. But for whatever reason, I'm here today. Would you use my life to help somebody? Now here, um, oh, sorry, the mic went crazy. Hopefully that didn't affect the audio. So um, he here's one of the things that I think is a, a, an important distinction that we need to make in the church. There are often times where we have amazing redemption stories of God, you know, redeeming people out of uh, pride, self-righteousness, um, sexual sins, uh, drug addictions, uh, just riotous living, like all, all sorts of things. Like we have churches that are full of people that have been redeemed from all kinds of different lifestyles. Um, and it is very important, I think, for us to live in communities, faith communities, that we know like each other's testimony. We know each other's stories. And that actually encourages and emboldens and helps us see how God works in all of these different circumstances and situations. That does not mean that, that we then give um, a Sunday morning or a platform to everyone that has like redemptive stories. Like the, in scripture, what we see are there are qualified individuals that are elders over a church that are to lead that church and to teach the scriptures well. Um, and again, not going to get into it. It's, we have a lot of videos that talk about this. But just because someone has a redemptive story doesn't mean they get the stage in order to then open up the scriptures. Because I think, to all due respect to, to Nick, I, I don't know anything about Nick. And this, again, isn't about Nick because I've seen lots of churches do this. But just because someone has a redemptive story doesn't mean they should be on stage attempting to preach. Because what we see is... And Hey, we'll end it here. We're, we're going to end it at 44 minutes and 40, uh, 44 minutes and 36 seconds. The sermon is 48 minutes, 43 seconds long. We're just going to end it because this review is getting pretty long. I don't like them to go much longer than an hour and a half. This being said, oftentimes churches are given, um, give the platform to people that have like great redemptive stories, um, but can't preach. And I, again, all due respect to Nick, he has not preached the scriptures this morning. He's given a lot of really good advice, right? So I don't think we could argue that um, what Nick has said, some of it's been really good advice. Some of it's been very inspirational. Some of it has been, I think, if somebody listened to it, it'd be like there's something you could draw from it, something helpful. But all of those things could also be said about, uh, you know, um, and it's just some inspirational speaker, some life coach, like all the same things could be said about them in regards to them saying something that encourages people or helps them or inspires them. What makes the Sunday morning gathering and the, 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 the proclamation of the word different than that is because everything is on the word and not on the person. Everything comes from the authority of scripture, not that person's authority. What we see is anchored in scripture and is good for life and practice of all believers. And one of the reasons we preach from the word is to demonstrate that well, to talk about the culture and context this was written in, to pull out the application and principles and say, as believers now, these principles and this application and how we should live applies to us as well through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit because of our belief that's been gifted to us the Father by the Father in who Jesus Christ is. And that's distinctively... Christ-centered. 
And though Nick hasn't just given us necessarily a bunch of like just great advice, he has again in the places that I pointed out woven together this, this reality that we do see things differently through the lens of the cross. That was really good. That whole section, but it wasn't, again, it, it would have been more powerful connected to scripture. I'm, I want to make sure that this isn't like, you don't take away that like, Oh, Nick's terrible. That's not what I'm saying. I just think Nick was put in a position in a situation in which he shouldn't have been in, which was to open the word, to preach it. And he does the best he can with it. And I think oftentimes that's what we see happen in a lot of churches is that there are people that, um, that have some really good advice and they use scripture as a jumping off point, but that's all it is. And though he did weave it together a bit, he doesn't focus on what's actually happening in there. It's analogized um, to where now the man being let out of the city is us being let out of our circumstances. Um, it's, you know, Jesus where we can see, we see people as trees, uh, because we need to, you know, see things through the tree. It's just a bunch of added extra stuff. So again, I, there's some good here. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying that there are, he, there's a lot that needs to be worked on, um, in regards to sermon development and, um, I can see why people are clapping and applauding because there are some things there that were really good, but I think the really good things are overshadowing the reality that we, we weren't in the scripture. So all that being said, guys, hopefully that was helpful. Once again, if you want to watch this whole thing without my commentary, link will be in the description below. One of the best ways you can help us uh, get this out and support this channel is to like, share, and subscribe, as well as if you want to, there's uh, some other ways below, buying some of the resources or the ultimate way, becoming a patron. We are not able to do what we do here without our patrons, so thank you for them. Their names are in the description below. We'll talk to you guys later.